very pleased to be here chairing this uh, closing discussion with Jane Bennett and Nadesh Latou. So I'll just begin by uh, giving a brief introduction to these two thinkers. So uh, Jane Bennett is Andrew W. Mellon Professor at the Humanities at John Hopkins University. And her latest books include Vibrant Matter, A Political Ecology of Things, and Influx and Efflux, Writing Up with Walt Whitman. I'm very happy to be here. And um, when Nidesh told me about the, this last conference, or this third, I guess, in, in, on, on Homo Mimeticus, um, I said, why don't, why doesn't he and I have, why don't we have a conversation? I would read a piece by him, a short piece by him. He would read a short piece by me. I would present his work. He would present mine. And, um, and then we raised some questions for conversation afterwards. And that's exactly what we decided to do. So I am going to present um, a paper that Nietzsche, uh, that Nidesh wrote um, uh, called Birth of Homo Mimeticus. And then he's going to present a paper I wrote, which I think is called Out for a Walk in the Middle Voice or something about mimetic entanglements. Um, anyway, um, the most gripping texts are often those that, gives word, that give words to or bespeak, to use an appropriately middle voice verb. Um, the most gripping texts are often those that bespeak experiences that now suddenly seem familiar as something you already kind of knew in the way that you had been dimly aware, perhaps, of that, quote, low hum of insects in an August woodland. That's a quote from, from Whitehead, not Nidesh. The most fascinating texts are those that illuminate by naming and narrating a relationship, a process, an encounter in which you've already been participating and which has been making a difference to the tenor, tone, or mood of your existence, even as it was operating mostly below the radar of conceptual and sensuous awareness. And this, I think, is what Lachu's Nietzschean essay on mimesis does. It bespeaks the ancient force of mimetic pathos, which is itself a process that inflects bodies even without first needing to pass through consciousness, although eventually they usually do. Mimetic pathos, says, Nietzsche, uh, says Nidesh, is the not quite felt feeling of being affected by an outside body and of having its look, its trajectory, or its rhythm or in Nietzschean terms that, that Nidesh quotes, of having its mean, pressure, or gesture repeat, reverberate, and resonate within one's own body. At the same time, one's own means, pressures, gestures, or stances, gates, and tones enter into and echo with other bodies. For modern selves, creatures who tend to feel themselves to be individuals with a unique center of decision and action, Mimetic pathos might be called, as Nidesh does call it, a will to mime. But Lachu makes it clear that this will to mime is less a property of a self than an effect of an encounter between porous bodies. What may feel like one's very own will is itself an unwilled response to an ongoing call for, from things for attention. The will is the effect of a mean, pressure, gesture coming from abroad co-mingling with efforts and trajectories pressing out from within. Now, Lachu extracts, and I think this is the wonderful achievement of the piece, it extracts a Nietzsche who is less a relativist or subjectivist than a diagnostician of psychosomatic affects and its cross-body circuitries. Mimesis is less a rational subject's imagination of what the other is thinking then it is the, quote, involuntary operation of nerve stimuli and bodily instincts, end quote, that associate a specific movement perceived on the outside with a corresponding sensation felt on the inside. And the, the lecture yesterday by Professor Galisi it was all about that. Quote, and this is uh, Nidesh, it is not consciousness or a rational logos that brings communication into being, on the contrary, it is a pre-existing communicative need triggered by affect or pathos that is the source of our becoming conscious rational beings. Now mimetic pathos evolved out of the need for a profoundly fragile creature, the human, to be able to read the likely disposition of the potentially dangerous creatures around them. 
by recreating in one's own body the feelings associated with the mean or gait or stance of the other. This imitation slash iteration of the other in the self, this quote, unconscious pathos or shared affect or sympathos, helps us to glean the quote, intention behind the feature of the other's bearing. And that's Nietzsche in Daybreak. Latu's thesis could be put simply as this. We are a species that became sapiens, that is developed consciousness, and I would add self-consciousness and language, because we were already mimeticus, already caught up, caught up in relays of movements imitated and their corresponding affects resynthesized. Mimetic pathos, Law II reveals, is ancient in both an ontogenetic and a phylogenetic sense. It is through imitated feeling that we grew into the adults here today able to philosophize about mimesis, even as we are sunk within it. And it is also in a uh, phylogenic sense through mimetic pathos that the human species conjured up consciousness, self-consciousness and language from its animal, vegetable, mineral being. Okay, now that I have offered this too brief summary of Lotu's storyline, let me turn to what I think is its distinctive political insight. It concerns Lotu's insistence upon the double nature of mimetic pathos. Mimetic pathos is a disease that also contains the possibility of its own cure. He demonstrates this doubleness by attending closely to the word pathology. Mimesis is the condition of possibility of an unhealthy pathology of contagion of, for example, of fascist crowds. But mimesis also lends itself to a practice of pathology, emphasis on the logy, or analysis by way of rational thought or logos that is internal to pathos. So this is a point I wanna uh, kind of accent, but Lotu is arguing that there is within pathos and, and mimetic pathos, there is a, a rational thought or logos that is internal to pathos. Um, here's Nidesh. Time and again, we shall see that homo mimeticus is radically vulnerable to the reflex pathos of mimesis, experiences it pow its power with her body, sometimes for the worse, opening up a plurality of pathological, antisocial violent forces. Nidesh continues, and yet at the same time, this mimetic subject can also mobilize all the tools of critical consciousness and the logos it entails in order to set up a diagnostic distance from mimetic pathos. I want to say a little bit more about this distancing. Latu says that logos is internal to pathos. Is Latu, I ask myself, a strange kind of rationalist for whom logos is the strongest counter to a tendentially cruel pathos? I note that Latu's claim here is not that there exists a healthy pro-life or let's say eros-driven tendency internal to pathos, although later he does say that. But here he's saying, um, it's not emphasizing the healthy pro-life or eros-driven tendency internal to pathos that is opposed to its diseased expression. No, what the claim is here is that the internal counter to a diseased pathos is the logos it allows. Although I also note that on the last page of his essay, Latu invokes the figure of a good pathos whose quote, vital bonds of sympathy, cooperation, public happiness, gay inclinations prompting chameleon-like metamorphoses, these two exist and they are faithful to the earth, end quote. Now, I would like to conclude with two challenging questions, one for Nidesh and one for myself. <laughs> one that Nidesh's paper proposed to me. Um, the first one to Nidesh. Okay, what is the etiology or genesis of this critical distance creating power, this logos? How is it that it is born from within mimetic pathos? I didn't, I didn't see how that, how does it emerge? How does this critical distance producing 
um, uh, logos emerge from out of pathos. Is it possible to give a genealogy of logos as part of your tale of an originary mimesis? How does the ecstasis or distance giving power of logos arise from the unconscious biosomatic process of mimesis? Now I see how unconscious mimesis could eventually have developed into linguistic forms of communication. So that part of the genealogy that you, that you developed through Nietzsche, I get. But, but linguistic forms of communication in the advent of language is not quite the same as a rational thought able to insert a critical distance between itself and the experiential immersion in mimetic relays. So I'm asking for a little bit more uh, on, on how, how is it that logos can emerge out of pathos since pathos is quite immersive and logos is distancing, self -dis like, a, like a standing outside the process. Um, so is language quite the same as rational thought able to insert its, a critical dis distance between itself and the experiential immersion in mimetic relays? Is it enough to say that quote, and this is Nidesh, the mimetic speed generated by a reflex sympathy or sympathos dealing with provides the imminent foundation on which dialogue, dialogos through words actually rests. Perhaps your view Nidesh, is that the necessarily imperfect translation effect of wordification or using language is responsible for the insertion of that distance. So I'm sort of asking about the phenomenological, it's, you know, how phenomenologically did this, um, this capacity to step outside emerge from uh, um, in, uh, in mimetic pathos? Now I'm not denying the experience of logos as a practice of critical distancing. I have had that experience. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> um, but can you say more about, you know, can you extend the genealogy that you, that you developed via Nietzsche? Can you say more about just how critical distancing emerged from an original process of mimetic exchange, sort of unconscious? Okay, so that's my question to you. The question to myself, you, Jane, are interested in thinking about mimesis as operative, mimetic pathos, as operative not only between people, not only between people and other animals, not even between people and plants, which I, I you know, I was like, oh, that, yeah. but I'm also interested in thinking about um, mimetic pathos as potentially operative between bodies of the widest variety of sorts, including those called inorganic. And so um, you, Jane, pursue a kind of neo-vitalist path. But after reading Nidesh's paper, how I ask myself, how much of the process of mimetic pathos that Nidesh describes so convincingly to you depends upon having a sensory neural structure that is more or less typical of human body? Clearly it is to some extent, obviously, but how much of it? How much of the mimetic process is a function of, to invoke Merleau-Ponty, the phenomenology of human perception? Is there not a need, Jane, for you to address more carefully the somatic specific limits to participation in mimetic pathos? I, you know, what I, I want to, I want to develop a, a set of claims whereby there's mimetic pathos or some kind of exchange between people, places, and things, between atmospheres, between bodies conceived in a very broad Spinoza sense, which include rocks, right? Um, but, but I need to think more about perhaps different modes of mimetic exchange that are dependent upon the material configuration of the, of the players, so to speak, involved in the process. To what extent is mimetic pathos a function of the very specific kinds of material configurations that are on the scene. And that's a question I'm asking for myself, which I, I, I tend to gloss over. The, yeah. And so your paper made me think about that. And my question for you, just to reiterate, is um, to say a bit more about if we can explore collectively um, how it is, what is the relationship between mimetic pathos and this peculiar function of standing outside oneself, or, or one way of putting it is inserting a critical distance 
between yourself and the process in which you never really fully extricate yourself. Yeah. So that's my comment. You can do me now. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jane. Uh, I think uh, you know we resonate on a number of of level because levels because your conclusion and, and the question you ask yourself was the question or one of the questions that I had in mind for you. Um, <laughs> so you ask yourself the question, which is which is even better, and you ask yourself the question in a mimetic genre, in a mimetic lexis, if I may. So you, Jay, uh, asking yourself the question, and uh, and this has to do with uh, I think the the format that we decided to hold this discussion, which we didn't plan in advance, right? So as as I'm making clear, um, we we are improvising it, and so I should say. I'm very happy that you uh, asked those questions and you proposed this format. Why? Because I think that there are entanglements between uh, what we could call vibrant matters and mimetic matters. Uh, and, and that these entanglements have partly to do with encounters. I've been talking about punctuating this conference and the encounter with you back at Hopkins with Bill uh, is part of this kind of genealogical resonance between two things that seem to be radically opposed. The uh, material, new materialist turn, object-oriented ontology, and the subject-oriented theory of mimesis. What do these things have in common? Nothing, uh, one would say. But as you show, <laughs> uh, the resonances are there. And my sense is that the mimetic turn flows into uh, the object-oriented turn and vice versa. And these are positive influences. Now, this is just to frame uh, my, my comment, which is really not a comment because I didn't want to uh, give a commentary of your piece because it was beautifully written. And I didn't want to spoil, you know, to having Jane Bennett's words, uh, you know, to share them. So I'm gonna read a selection of uh, your uh, piece. And uh, since, uh, you know, I see myself as this ring in a chain and a ring that mediates is a passeur as uh, we use the term before. And I will punctuate it a little bit with some of my own language and common. Most of it, it's Jane Bennett that I'm reading. It's 80%, 90% Jane Bennett. And those of you who know Jane Bennett very well, who know me very well, will be able to tell the difference between the two. But with mimetic exercises, it's always a bit tricky anyway. Resonating efforts. Through the examples of two strolls, one in which a man finds himself inscribed by vegetal forms of powers, and one performed by a graphic line and listing the energies of a human hand to become a doodle, this dialogic essay affirms a radical entanglement of human and ahuman activities and seeks a mimetic language capable of acknowledging such a transpecies kind of mimesis. Essay, or as Montaigne would say, an essay is both noun and verb, thing and act, a written composition of moderate lengths on a particular subject, an activity of trying, attempting, endeavoring, what follows is an essay that endeavors to write up in human words the more than human quality of essaying. It is an attempt to remember the extent to which writing is itself a more than human effort. It is an essay about the multi-species nature of essaying and about how to use words to bespeak that nature. An essay then enjoys a potentially dangerous doubling or redoubling of identities that if it proliferates can easily turn into a crowd or throng. It engages a contagious worm. It takes on the pulse, it tangles with a tangle. I, or better, Jane Bennett, notices that the four figures of process just invoked are not perfect synonyms. Throng intimates a process populated by relatively discrete entities, bodies, and their interactions, whereas pulse and swarm summon more incohate materialities, variable energies and exact shapes, forming rhythmic currents, echoing refrains or buzzing clouds. Must essaying involve an agent behind the action? 
as Nietzsche famously noted, the grammatical function of language insistently separate out a substantial something that makes it happen from what happens. And this is a quote from Nietzsche. It is thus not at all easy to keep process in the conceptual and perceptual foreground, or to remember that even apparently singular agents are porous, transitioning shapes, throbbing with the pulse of a long history of mimetic relays and vulnerable to new ones. Mimetic relays may speak to a porous subject that is not a self-enclosed ego, but a phantom ego located at the crossroads where activity and passivity, self and other, consciousness and the unconscious meet in passing for an encounter generating a shared affect or sympathos that is not only human for as every walker knows, is open to non-human influences as well. Nietzsche, a lover of walks, called the sympathy that walks over and beyond human and non-human crossroads, not a being, not a becoming, but a pathos. Another lover of walks, Henry Thoreau, in a weird journal entry of 1851, describing his encounter with vegetable with vegetal and atmospheric forces highlights that presence too. After considering the way Thoreau writes up his walking amidst ray grass and summer heat, I or you turn to walks taken in 2020 by the lines of some doodles. That lines too go for a walk is Paul Clay's claim. He tells his Bauer's art students in the 1920s that Eine aktive Linie, die sich freier geht, ein Spaziergang um, ein, um seiner selbst willen, ohne Ziel. An active line moving freely goes for a stroll on its own, without destination. But how to bespeak such a transpecies vibrancy with a grammar of active subjects and acted upon objects? Perhaps a walk can help. Walking is good for your health, and as an old peripatetic tradition attests, good for all, good for philosophizing. Let us walk along the Ilios River as we talk, says Phaedrus to Socrates and to the Cicadas. Thoreau, on his side, reports the impress of atmosphere, the brew of summer sun, heat, humidity, dust, pollen, sweat, breeze, and buzz of billions of insects. His living atmosphere presses upon sensitive flesh, that flesh pushes along the impressions to the whole body, whose mat becomes that of a drowsy fog, and whose posture and rhythm becomes those of an art. I can only nod like the rye heads in the breeze. Atmosphere infuses into man and plant. It inaugurates nodding in Thoreau, nodding in Thoreau and in rye heads. The atmosphere activity is more of an induction than a production, for it operates amidst the extant tendencies and properties of the materiality of flesh and grain. Flesh and grain are, for example, permeable and sensitive to wind, heat, and moisture. They can stand upright. They are capable of the movement style of the sway, the bob, and nod. What is at work in the scene that Thoreau writes up is a distributed agency requiring active participation from both giver and receiver. Or, to use a more platonic but not less material language, receives form as it gives form, generating a plastic subject that impresses as she is impressed. This paradoxical movement is at the heart of the paradox of mimesis, but in a different medium, is perhaps also at play in the formative and transformative lines of doodling. And here I should have the images. We pause them later. A line strides outward, forward, backward, sideways, laying down paths of different speeds and shapes. Languid tendrils, intense curlicue, billowy fringe, serpentine arch, fractal branch, recursive fold, diffuse swarm, restless zigzag, straight or detouring arrow. Again, a lively creature is not always linear. As an inveterate doodler, you, Jane, are familiar with strolling lines, flowing down arm, finger, pencils, 
and out of the graphite tip, joining and diverging from trajectories already taken by predecessors on the page. Predecessors, to be sure, are models to imitate, but in imitation, something new emerges as it asks, for instance, how does doodling unravel an anthropocentric model of action of what it is to act? The doodle bears witness to outdoor forces that have seeped in and to the distributive conjoint quality of action. A messy swarm of outdoor elements activates a drawing process which leans into the momentum of strolling lines, which taps the shoulder of the human doodler who lends her arm to the pencil, <clears throat> which gives the knot to emergent shapes or thoughts. Outdoor elements can in fact be at play as a lively windy atmosphere might interfere with all to human activities like, like reading a paper for instance, even this paper. And here I have some images of me reading your, the paper up in the mountains with the wind and I was just struggling to hold it. Just, <laughs> that was kind of you know performative dimension of uh, what you're describing. This is actually what happened as I was literally reading James' paper a week ago in my favorite album, Atmosphere. We turn now to the productive paradox of writing about actions that enlist the high human and alinguistic. A poetic that gives a nod to the contributions of high human endeavoring might dramatize the fact that metaphors remain infused and fueled by the physical forces more obviously at work when one is out in the sun on a really hot day. Such a rhetoric might also try to speak with a tongue that is ramified or many branched, like a huge old tree or a neuronal network, or perhaps with a voice that is rhizomatic in the sense of being all branches and not trunk or a rhizomatic trunk. Such a rhetoric would be room enough to accommodate a heterogeneous, heterogeneous world of agents, some human, some not. It would find workarounds to the grammar of subject and objects in order to display how writing up consists in overlapping waves of expressive effort. Some mine, some yours, and some a personal. Which brings me finally to the middle voice. What middle voice verbs do is name action coming from within an ongoing process where the action engages and affects the actors. The subject of the predicate neither directs the activity, the active voice, nor is acted upon, the passive voice, but participates in a lively process while being processed by it. In the middle voice, there is no posited an agent anterior to the process, but rather, the subject is immediately contemporary with the act being affected and affected by it. And here Jane is quoting Emil Benvenist. The middle voice distinguishes a mode of action whose prompts come from multiple sources and whose efficacy is the function, not of a discrete agency, but of a complex recursive process. I was out. It indicates instead an affectivity and effectivity amidst a complex heterogeneous atmospheric process. The act name is less an intervention by a discrete self into a background environment than a movement within and by virtue of a heterogeneous and lively atmosphere. All this in the end suggests that a rhetoric for composite or compositional or composed agency would be sprinkled liberally and process-oriented verbs to induce, to animate, to inflect, to partake, to sing, to sound, to read, to write. Such verbs mark activities with multiple loci, loci of impetus and they position partakers as already caught up in an ongoing flow that precedes them and to which they may add impetus, drag, verb. Such verbs position human participants as always already involved in a creative flow before it is possible to feel themselves being so, before they take action. We are middle voiced partakers on a walk, even more than actors or recipients. Like the neo-vitalist, new materialist, 
assemblage focused and non-human mimetic or hypermimetic terms in scholarship that have made it possible to define this as a task. Discussions of how to use words in a world of vibrant, resonating materials are still fledging, but we, but we be trying and perhaps we be flying. So this was papers, uh, uh, Jane's papers uh, with some sprinkled rhetoric coming from my side, but mostly from Jane. Uh, and I didn't wanna uh, give a distant diegetic account of your work, but I wanted to perform it from within with some variations. Um, I hope you don't mind the, the variations. And my question to you, um, well, I have also a series of questions. Maybe the first one is, why after bracketing the subject in vibrant matter um, and uh, suspending the question of subjectivity in order to bring into the foreground the agentic power of, uh, of matter uh, often in a, in a, in a considered in a distributed way. So what you call distributive agency and, and think power. And um, so you, put what is in the background in the foreground. Why after this move in your recent book, Influx and Efflux, you returned to the question of subjectivity, specifically from the angle of a, of a subject that is mimetic in the sense that we understand it. Porous, relational, uh, affective, uh, uh, easily uh, prey to magnetic and hypnotic spells. Why does the materialist turn or the new materialist turn uh, need mimesis in order to move further? That would be my first question. And the second question is the question that you ask yourself on transspecies mimesis. Uh, and uh, indeed in uh, influx and efflux, you pay attention to figures like Roger Caillois, which we've been discussing within the Homo Mimeticus project that uh, already crosses the human non human divide specifically via mimicry, animal mimicry. And, uh, and my question to you was how deep can we go in uh, expanding the notion of mimesis beyond the human into the animal realm, into the sphere of uh, vegetative matter or even uh, non-organic matter when mimesis is nonetheless a process that requires some physiological functions, which is exactly the question that you ask yourself. So I don't have to ask it again. And maybe since I talked for a while and I, I need some time to, to think about your question about pathos and logos, I let you maybe start if you agree with uh, uh, answering the first question, why mimesis in uh, the non-human term. Thank you, Nidesh. That was very, very nice. I'm very honored that you did that, so thank you. Um, okay. Um, I wanna ask you about the mimesis part in this, but, but I'll just respond to the part of the question which said, um, why a return to questions of, this, of subjectivity? Yeah, because um, to imagine agency or to start to build a model of ac action and effect producing, effect production um, that understands that as being, mm, that, that uses a model that doesn't have fixed subjects that um, intervene into a scene in which they're allegedly not already affected or, you know. Um, to talk about distributive agency doesn't mean that the elements contributing the elements in the distribution, it doesn't mean that they don't matter. It doesn't mean that they add nothing. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a passivity. So that's what I tried to do with the middle voice. The act, it's neither, you know, active and passive. Yes, there are, that's a useful descriptor for many things, but most, most happenings fall somewhere else, neither quite fully active nor passive. And so to talk about distributive agency and the agency of materials that are human and non-human, I didn't want to say that people don't matter and that there's not an, in a felt sense of adding your effort to an ongoing flow. Just because you don't control the flow, just because you're not a you know a rational subjective subject or you know or self self enclosed agent, doesn't mean that you 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 don't matter at all or that the that everybody 
doesn't have a small contribution to make, more or less along the lines of when you're riding a bicycle, you're not really in charge of the whole thing. There's the wind, there's the machine of the bike, there's the pavement and this and that. And you, but you do add, but you as the human subject of the bicycle, so to speak, you add something by tilting, by throwing your weight one way or not, by, by uh, directing your efforts or uh, which in this direction rather than the other one. So I wanted to try to begin to, I mean, it's not just me, many people are doing this, try to come up with a philosophical vocabulary other than that of will and intentionality um, that, can, that can mark the ways in which effort propulsion or efforting or essaying um, um, matters. It, it, it's not nothing. Um, and so I wanted to, so I wanted to return back to how can you make sense of the fact that A, there's this, I mean, it's not just a, um, a historical illusion that I think of myself as, ha think of myself as having an effort on the inside that can be added to the, to the, to the atmospherics. Um, that I wanted to, I didn't want to deny that. I wanted to come up with a philosophical vocabulary that can name um, the ways in which this, uh, it's very hard to talk without using the old vocabulary, but the way in which this inside initiative or impetus um, can make a difference to the, to the, to the, to the milieu. To the, to the assemblage. And um, in order to do that, I wanted to, you need to return to the question of, the, of, the, of subjectivity, which is this sort of fold, this, 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 this experience of oneself as having interiority of having a fold on, um, um, that, that feels different um, than when you're, that, that feels, that has a distinctive affective tone to it. You, you maybe used to call that uh, my ego, you know, <laughs> and I and now I'm starting to. I didn't ever quite really understand what you meant, Nidish, by the phantom e ego. But this this conversation here, your your comments earlier before, helped me to see that, see more about that. Um, and I think your you which you sharing my project of coming up with a vocabulary for talking about and naming the efforting quality of separable bodies which are always already always connected to other things, but there's also, a, there's also a, an affective tone that goes to the sense that, that uh, uh, accompanies yourself as feeling, having an inside that's not reducible to, to the collective, to the, to, the, to the distributed agency, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, if we shift the ontological imaginary to, to, to thinking about materialities of having, as having force, maybe not all the way to agency, maybe just uh, um, effectivity or efficacy. If we shift that ontological imaginary to what I've been thinking about in terms of, and many others in terms of vibrant matter, um, that doesn't mean, that, that what that means is that you have to shift the vocabulary used to talk about what used to be called individual subjectivity. Yeah, and so that, that's what I was trying to do there. Like, how could you still make room for that oomph difference that individual bodies put out there um, in a world of vibrant matter? So I don't think I've gone very far along in that route. Um, I, I, I talked a little bit about um, the grammar of, um, you know, English grammar makes it difficult to think along those lines. And so then I stumbled upon this long discourse of middle voice verbs, which are not formally marked in English, but are more act, you know, more, more marked in say ancient Greek or um, Sanskrit. And um, so I started to think about grammatical forms that may be able to highlight forms of efforting in ways that do not slink back down into active intervening strong agents versus passive background matrix. So that's, that's the thing there. Um, so mimesis, so mimesis keeps happening, this mimetic pathos that you so wonderfully describe in that paper. But that's, that still is ongoing, but it's not, 
it doesn't erase completely that oomph factor, for lack of a better, yeah. Um, and then the second question about, um, I'll just, maybe that's enough there, but um, on the second question, the question that we both share, I think the real nub there, the real, the real interesting trouble there is how can you talk about mimetic pathos when we can only report one side of the pathos? Like, you know, if there's an exchange between me and an atmosphere, I have no idea what the atmosphere is feeling. Very, very difficult. You can speculatively and um, poetically try to describe that. And as many poets are excellent at that, and I find inspiration in them. But, um, but really, um, I, I have very little access to what the affectivity is like for bodies that are radically different than my own, not just amongst humans, but I, at least there, there's, there's bridges can be built. It's much more difficult to, bridge, to talk about a mimetic exchange where you can only give a, a good description or even, you know, you can only give a somewhat thick description from one, from one side, yeah. That's starters. Thanks, uh, thanks very much indeed. That's um, uh, along the lines I was thinking when I was reading your paper in the wind. I feel the force of the wind. The wind is certainly, you know, having an agentic impact in my reading process uh, and everything that surrounds me, the atmosphere, the sun. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, it's not exactly a mimetic process in the, in the same register as I might have with a human or, uh, or with an animal. Um, uh, and uh, and so I think you're addressing that that difficult limit of uh, yeah. Uh, um, one other thing about that is like when Thoreau talks about his mimetic exchange with the um, grass, the dry the grass that's waving, he, he he makes recourse to similarities in shape and movement style, which could be a cross species, high, a beginning of a cross species vocab, you know, uh, communicative. Forum there, because he notices that you know the the, the rye glass grass is is vertical and able to go like this, and he's walking and he shares a, a vertical plane, a, a strata of a similar vertical plane, and that that's like the very bare beginnings of a communicative relay there. So he focuses on physical shape um, and movement style, and which I thought was very tellingly like what you talked about in Nietzsche, where he talks about. The importance in this mimetic pathos, of course, he's thinking primarily in terms of human to human. Um, when he talks, so he names mean or the facial expression. Um, um, uh, what were the I forget what the other words? Pressure, and um, um, what was the other one? But like uh, it, it referred to a movement style or or, or a, a gait. So there's some kind of physicalities that are shared along some very generic uh, in some very generic ways like um, how things, like I don't have the same body as, as, a, as, a, as a stalk of grass by any means, but there's a, there's a vertical plane that we share and we're all both susceptible to wind. So, you know, you, you, you start from those small bits, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's about, it's about using a, a poetic vocabulary to heighten awareness of those, of those potential intersections or overlaps. Also, they're necessarily vague and inexact um, and that's okay. So you have a vague and exact and exact vocabulary or or writing style that 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 kind of gestures in the direction of them without striving for too for too much specificity, which is which is too much for the for the actual exchange. You know, it, it's it's not appropriate to the cross species in, uh, mimetic encounters. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, I think it is important to think about this potential moment of, of overlap and intersection, it was interesting. I mean, theories of animism, for instance, that are returning now and that used to be derided as pre-logical and primitive and so forth, I think can, can find uh, support by neuroscientists like Vittorio Gallese who tell us, us that metaphorical language has an impact on our brain. And so if we, if we hear an image uh, or we say, uh, as you point out, I think in an essay, on the one hand, on the other hand, there is a certain gesture, indeed a physicality that contributes to thinking. So I think there is a strong resonance there. 
but uh, uh, maybe not to evade completely your difficult and important question, I'll say a few words about that and then maybe we open it for discussion so people can ask you other questions. Indeed, you touch on something that we've discussed many times before, which is the difficult question that emerged already many times during the conference, you know, how to turn, you know, an affective potentially pathological mimesis into uh, a more critical and distance and conscious uh, uh, position. And uh, uh, I'm afraid I, I don't have a, a magic formula on, on the interplay between, between the two, except to say that they pathologies, that, that dash that connects the pathos and logos is a moment of both connection and disconnection. Or to use a Deleuzean language, it's a conjunctive disjunction. There is, a, there is no dialectic necessarily that, that emerges into a synthesis in which then consciousness absorbs uh, the pathos. Um, so moving away from a language that clearly divides consciousness from the unconscious, is one of the moves that I've been doing via Nietzsche. And that uh, is very much in line with, with the work of Borg Jacobsen uh, in his uh, critique of psychoanalysis and recuperation of theories of hypnosis, where the distinction between consciousness and the unconscious is, is, uh, is this blurry in-between zone. It's a spectrum, uh, Gabriel Tert says. And what Andrea Briganti was discussing before, you know, as a, a state of somnambulism, the social state as a state of imitation, a state of uh, somnambulism, as being in the metro and then waking up and where I, am I? I don't need an interpretation uh, to access that unconscious. Uh, I just need a phenomenological attention to my body yeah? and to notice a degree of awareness. Now I'm pretty awake, even though I'm tired and I'm kind of trying to answer your difficult question, but even half an hour, I will be, my body will be in a different disposition, to use your term, simply by being surrounded by my kids or relaxing and having a glass of wine after three days of conference. Am I going to be totally unconscious? No. The mimetic unconscious is this <laughs> spectrum of registers that I think requires each time new phenomenological analysis. And what I want to say with the pathologies or the pathos of distance is to call attention to the fact that there is no outside of pathos, that uh, consciousness uh, or logos understood both as language and, and reason is tied to a bodily pathos. Uh, so that's why once again, listening to Galese yesterday when he was uh, for a neuroscientist, for somebody who spent his entire life studying the brain saying, well, the brain is basically con sending an energy throughout the entire body. I'm not my brain. Uh, uh, you know, it, it has to do with the entire motor system, with our entire body dispositions, and consciousness is not located in, in one place. So I don't have a formula on how to, you know, turn one into the other. I think that education is the place where we can call attention to how to shift to what Bill calls higher registers uh, um, of, uh, of consciousness in order to uh, pay attention to how the subliminal war one works because those are the ones that tend to be uh, forgotten or dismissed sp specifically in rationalist, uh, idealist strands of, of philosophy. Uh, and uh, when Bill was saying in his lecture that there is no moving, there is no getting away of the, the affects or the visceral register that is currently at play in the body politic, let's say in France during the election, we, there is no getting away of that, that is operating, but uh, becoming aware of how that works might allow people on the left uh, or people who work on education to become uh, more attuned to those registers and try to inflect them in, 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 in a non-violent, positive and vitalist direction. I don't have a formula. What I, what I notice, for instance, is when I watch a movie, I need a total bodily absorption in order to feel the experience, the aesthetic experience. And aesthetics comes from sensation. It's a, it's a bodily uh, experience but then I need to sleep over it. And in the morning, I will, tie, I will begin my, automatically. I will, I will begin to see how the beginning 
is linked to the middle and to the conclusion. And my brain will start seeing relations that in the immediate affective bodily experience, I didn't see, but I absorb them. Um, that's why in the morning they are totally there. And, and it's a different process that requires more distance. Very often writing is a medium to move from the pathos to the logos for people like in but, our profession. What do you think of this, Nidesh? What do you think of this? Maybe what we're calling logos or critical distance is not other, you're saying it, it's not other to pathos. It's not, it's not outside the mimetic pathos. Maybe what we're calling logos or critical distance isn't, isn't an affect, say the affect of float, the feeling of a float, because I'm interested in how it is, since I'm so convinced that when that we're always in the process and we're always never escaping all of that, you know, I, but, but how is it that you have the affect of critical distance or standing apart? Maybe it's, maybe, maybe logos is the pursuit of the, of the, the, the dim affect of float or, or, or you could give another name to it or of, 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 of I don't know what else it would be. Maybe you mentioned flying. I don't know. Something where you're, you're, yeah, I don't know what it is, but maybe we're making a false, you know, through, because history of philosophy, logos, pathos, ethos, but maybe logos is a, is an, is a, is a, is a pathos. Indeed, so that dash is connecting the two and yeah. terms are provisional terms. Once again, you know, it's not uh, setting up a, a binary between yeah. the two. There are kind of pegs uh, to position ourselves somehow in between and floating maybe is a good, is a good, uh, is a good image for that. But I see that uh, there are a number of people who want to intervene and ask you questions. So I think at this stage, we, we should open uh, the floor for discussion.